Our final speaker this evening is the Honorable Mr. Justice John Gerald Joseph uh, Archie O'Driscoll. Uh, Mr. Justice O'Driscoll was born in Sault Ste. Marie and he was raised there and he did uh, some of his secondary school education in the Sioux. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Toronto, St. Michael's College, uh, in 1951, attended Osgoode Hall Law School from 1951 to 55, and then he, uh, or during that time, he articled in 1953 and 1954 for C.T. Murphy, now His Honor Judge Murphy at Sault Ste. Marie, and also articled again, it looks like, in 1954, 1955 for Arthur Maloney. Did you fail your first? <laughs> um, he was called to the bar of Ontario in 1955. Uh, from 1955 to 1959, Mr. Justice O'Driscoll uh, Jr. for Mr. Arthur Maloney. And in 1959, he commenced his own practice in Toronto under the firm name of O'Driscoll, Kelly and McRae and practiced in this regard from 1959 to 1971. In 1971, he was elected a bencher of the law, I'm sorry, actually in 1967, he was elected a bencher uh, of the Law Society, and again in March of 1971, he was appointed a Queen's Counsel in December of 1967, and then in 1971, he was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court of Ontario and a member of the High Court of Justice, uh, where he presently remains. I give you the Honourable Mr. Justice O'Driscoll. I did not fail my year. <laughs> Those of you who are here are probably too young to remember the old days when we went to school, law school for two years, then we articled full time for a year and then we came back and our last year was, we went to class nine to 10, we worked 10 to four and we went to class four to five. It was an awful year. Uh, this is the third period. We've. Uh, had two periods on, on left wing, now we're gonna have a period on right wing. <laughs> it is uh, indeed a, an honor to be invited to speak to you this evening. Mr. Brian, Brian Greenspan and Mr. Michael Moldaver have asked me to speak on the topic of constructive murder. It was a hot summer's day when I was asked to do this. November 581 seemed a long way off, and I unwittingly said yes. Believe me, the next time a witness before me says I was conned, I will know exactly how he feels. Why was I asked? The only reason that I can think of is at the present time Mr. Greenspan has two or three of my charges to juries on constructive murder under analysis and about to be placed upon the table for dissection by the Ontario Court of Appeal. And I think Mr. Greenspan wanted to see if I would repeat some of the silly things that I said in those charges. <laughs> the, the topic of constructive murder is deceptive. The topic is huge. It leads you from one thing to another. It reminds me somewhat of an English maze. The law of constructive murder has, so to speak, come to the fore in the last 10 years. In the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in Gina versus Vassal, which I will refer to later on, Mr. Justice Antonio Lemaire, who gave the judgment of the, the court, starts out this way. Though section 212C of the criminal code has been with us since codification in 1892, it was then section 227D. The more serious questions as to its meanings and scope 
have, save a few exceptions, been raised in the courts below only recently. We have been told that this may well be explained by the fact that on an indictment for murder, counsel for the Crown are more frequently than in the past, and quite properly so, requesting when the factual basis of the case so justifies that the judge instruct the jury as to the application of this section in lieu of or subsidiary to the other murder sections. Only two cases are to be found in the law reports where this court has dealt with the meaning and purview of section 212C of the criminal code. Over 65 years ago in the case of Graves and the King and almost 40 years ago in the case of Rex and Hughes. If, sorry, you are in for a big disappointment if you came here today hoping to find all the answers to all of the things you've always wanted to know about constructive murder. The fact that I can, that all I can say for my endeavors is that I hope that I may have been able to pinpoint the problems for you. You will all have a copy of a paper that I prepared some 20 or so pages long. And in that paper, there's, there's nothing new or brilliant, but I tried to collect in one convenient place the sections of the criminal code and the leading cases and references that touch upon the topic. As a trial judge, I can tell you that the topic of constructive murder causes many trial judges to burn a lot of midnight oil in a lot of hotels and motels across this province. As a trial judge, I also say that some of the judgments on this topic absolutely defy logical analysis. What is constructive murder? It is the law passed by the Parliament of Canada that defines a homicide as a murder when the person caused the death of a human being in the course of committing another crime involving violence to the person. It is defined as murder under the law even though the circumstances do not come within the definition of what I call simple murder as defined in section 212 of the criminal code. Constructive murder is sometimes referred to as the felony murder rule. What relevant sections of the criminal code deal with the question of constructive murder? First of all, we have section 213. Culpable homicide is murder, where a person causes the death of a human being while committing or attempting to commit. And then there are a whole series of, of uh, crimes listed, hijacking an aircraft, escaping, or rescue from prison, or lawful custody, rape, or attempt to commit rape, and then on down in includes robbery, kidnapping, and forcible confinement. Whether or not the person means to cause death to any human being, and whether or not he knows that death is likely to be caused to any human being, if, A, he means to cause bodily harm for the purpose of facilitating the commission of the offense, or facilitating his flight after committing or attempting to commit the offense, and the death ensues from the bodily harm. B, he administers a stupefying or overpowering thing for the purpose mentioned in A, and the death ensues therefrom. C, he willfully stops by any means the breath of a human being for a purpose mentioned in paragraph A, and the death ensues therefrom. Or C, this is what's called draconian, he uses a weapon or has it upon his person during or at the time he commits or attempts to commit the offense, or during or at the time of his flight after committing or attempting to commit the offense, and the death ensues as a consequence. Section 2 tells you what offensive weapon and, or weapon means. And then you have section 21.2 that brings in the other people involved, where two or more persons form an intention in common to carry out an unlawful purpose and to assist each other therein, and any one of them in carrying out the common purpose commits an offense. Each of them who knew or ought to have known that the commission of the offense 
would be a probable consequence of carrying out the common purpose is a party to that offence. I suppose it's not very judicial, but that's what I call a funny thing happened on the way to the forum section. Section 24, this is attempts. Everyone who, having an intent to commit an offence, does or omits to do anything for the purpose of carrying out his intention is guilty of an attempt to commit the offence, whether or not it was possible under the circumstances to commit the offence. 222 says attempted murder is an indictable offence. Then you have constructive first degree murder. That's found in section 214, subsections 4, 5, and 6. Irrespective of whether a murder is planned and deliberate on the part of any person, murder is first degree when the victim is a police officer, constable, names them, B, a warden, a deputy warden, so forth, C, a person working in a prison. Five says, irrespective of whether murder is planned and deliberate on the part of any person, murder is first degree murder, in respect of a person when the death is caused by that person while committing or attempting to commit an offense under section 76.1, hijacking an aircraft, or 247, kidnapping or forcible confinement, or B, while committing an offense under section 144, rape or attempted rape, or while committing or attempting to commit an offense under 149, indecent assault on a female, or 156, indecent assault on a male. And then six says, murder is first degree murder in respect of a person when the death is caused by that person and that person has been previously convicted of either first degree or second degree murder. I haven't seen one of those prosecutions yet. I imagine that would be a nightmare. How do you prove it and yet keep it from the jury at the same time? Then you have the 212C, um, which is culpable homicide as murder, where a person for an unlawful object does anything that he knows or ought to know is likely to cause death and thereby causes death to a human being, notwithstanding that he desires to affect his object without causing death or bodily harm to any human being. The history of, of constructive murder <clears throat> was uh, set out by Mr. Justice Martin in Regina versus Gov Adarov, G-O-V-E-D-A-V-O-V, -O -V, Pov Povic and Askov, 1974. It was a five-member court, and Mr. Justice Martin gave the judgment of the court. It was an appeal dealing with the question of the meaning of the word burglary, <clears throat> And the majority, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the majority judgment of the Interior Court of Appeal. All these cases are set out in, in the material, the citations at any rate. In the history given by Mr. Justice Martin, he points out that in 1947, Section 260 was amended by adding indecent assault to the list of offenses set out in 260 and by adding paragraph D, which as I said has been referred to uh, as draconian, that is, if he uses or has upon his person any weapon during or at the time of the commission or attempted commission by him of any of the offenses in this section mentioned or the flight of the offender upon the commission or attempted commission thereafter. This case came about as a result of the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, I'm sorry, that section came about as a result of a decision in the Supreme Court of Canada in uh, Rex and Hughes, um, where the Supreme Court of Canada held that a death caused in the perpetration of an armed robbery by the accidental discharge of a pistol held in the hand of the accused did not constitute murder unless the jury was satisfied that the conduct of the accused was such that he ought to have anticipated that some person's death was likely to be caused thereby. And in the subsequent decision in the Supreme Court of Canada, Roe and the King, Mr. Justice Kerwin, as he then was, said that paragraph D was enacted as a result of the court's decision in Hughes. And Hughes, as I recall it, uh, there was a robbery and the, the victim and uh, forgotten which one of the named accused uh, became 
got into a, a drape and rolled around in the drape on the floor and the gun went off and the accused said it was an accidental discharge of the gun during the course of the, of the robbery. Section D of 213 did not then exist and the uh, Supreme Court of Canada said he should have been convicted of manslaughter. Then the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1975 added several new crimes to the list in Section 213 and in general updated the wording of the section to conform with the expression used in the criminal code. The most important change was the replacement of burglary with breaking and entering introduced as a result of the Regina versus Pavic case, which I have already mentioned. Because in that case, the Supreme Court of Canada held that burglary is a term no longer found in the criminal code and referred only to breaking and entering a dwelling house by night and not breaking and entering any place without regard to the time of day. The amendment of, to Section D also adds to the list of offenses, airplane hijacking. And that, unlike Section 212C, murder under 213 involves no consideration of whether death was a foreseeable or even a likely consequence. Constructive murder has its critics and also it has its admirers. Mr. Justice Martin points out in the Popovic case, the Criminal Code of 1892 substantially modified the common law doctrine of constructive murder, which had and continued to have many eminent critics, including Sir James Stephen. The constructive malice has since been abolished in England by the Homicide Act of 1957. Justice Martin went on, whenever Parliament has departed from the restrictive policy with respect to constructive murder reflected in the Criminal Code of 1892 by enlarging that doctrine, it has done so expressly. As I said, some have called the concept of constructive murder unfair. Some lawyers, some judges, some law reformers refer to it as draconian. Professor Willis has referred to it as savage. On the other hand, Mr. Justice Rottles said, we think that the object and the scope of this branch of the law is at least this, that he who uses violent measures in the commission of a felony involving personal violence does so at his own risk and is guilty of murder if those violent measures result even inadvertently in the death of the victim. For this purpose, the use of a loaded firearm in order to frighten the person victimized into submission is a violent measure. A and B and C all agree to rob a bank and help each other out and divide the spoils. A is to be the wheelman, B is to be the lookout, and C is to enter the bank and actually do the stick up. A and B each knows that C will have a loaded handgun on his person as he enters the bank to do the stick up. During the course of the robbery, C accidentally shoots and kills a customer in the bank. C is charged and convicted of second degree murder. A and B are also charged with second degree murder. That is the wheel man and the lookout man. Does it offend the average Canadian sense of justice to have each of A and B also convicted of second degree murder based on the law and theory of constructive murder? The the Supreme Court of the United States presently has the constructive murder issue before it. And that court has to decide the issue, and this is how it was referred to <clears throat> in the Globe and Mail, where I saw it on the, fort on the 20th of October. And the lead on the story was, Top U.S. Court to Rule on Non-Trigger Men. The U.S. Supreme Court said yesterday it will decide whether the death penalty can be used for non-trigger men, criminals, who did not intend anyone to die in their crimes and took no part in the actual killings. The latest study of capital punishment's con constitutionality probably will not affect most of the more than 800 people on death rows in the United States. But most of the 37 states with the death penalty have so-called felony murder laws permitting death sentences for people who are convicted murderers even though they never planned a death or participated in an actual killing. Earl Edmund, an inmate on Florida's death row, says his death sentence for the murders on April 175 of two people in Hardy County, Florida, violates the constitutional ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Mr. Edmund's appeal says he helped plan the robbery of Thomas and Eunice Kersey's home near Wakula, Florida, 
but did not know his accomplices would kill them. The trial testimony showed Mr. Edmond was not in the Kersey home when the killings occurred, but was waiting in a getaway car. The Florida Supreme Court rejected Mr. Edmond's appeal, ruling the Constitution does not prevent imposition of the death penalty because, just because the evidence does not show the defendant intended to kill someone. Urging the United States' highest court to uphold the state ruling, Florida Attorney General Jim Smith said, there is competent authority that a defendant's lack of intent to kill should not be a bar to the imposition of the death penalty. Mr. Smith said Mr. Edmonds' involvement in the crime was much more substantial than he would have the court believe. He said that Mr. Edmond originated the robbery plan, planned the holdup, drove the getaway car, and then helped dispose of the murder weapons. Constructive murder and proof of a mental element. The Supreme Court of Canada recently considered a case where the appellant was charged with first degree murder and the Crown alleged that during the course of indecently assaulting the female deceased, the appellant stabbed her 132 times with a knife and thereby committed first degree murder under the combination of section 213D and section 214 subsection 5B of the criminal code. This of course is the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada and, and Swaletsky versus the Queen. And Mr. Justice McIntyre gave the unanimous judgment of the court. This is the, the weapon section. He said, it is apparent at once that section 213D, the weapon section of the criminal code, differs significantly from paragraphs A, B, and C of that section. Each of A, B, and C requires proof of a mental element to procure a conviction of murder. In paragraph A, an intent to cause bodily harm for the purpose of facilitating the commission of the underlying offense or facilitating flight after the commission of the attempted commission of the offense. Paragraph B, the administration of a stupefying or overpowering drug. Paragraph D differs from the others in that it requires only possession or use of a weapon during the commission or attempted commission of the underlying offense or during or at the time of the flight after committing or attempting to commission of the offense. No mental element is required under paragraph D beyond the minimal intent to use or have a weapon. The subsection applies irrespective of any intent to cause death or any knowledge of its likelihood where an accused while armed is shown to have committed or attempted to commit the commission of one of the offenses named in the section. It therefore becomes necessary in ascertaining the mental elements required for the establishment of criminal liability under 213D of the code to consider the mental elements of the underlying offense, the commission of which calls the section into play, in this, pardon me, in this case, indecent assault. This I consider to be so for reasons which I will develop later because in my opinion the mental elements for murder under 213D cannot be less than those required for the commission of the underlying offense which invokes the section. Uh, you'll have all that with in the materials that you will get. Let me just <clears throat> speak a moment about 213 and 21.2. I suppose the, the, the common situation we have of that is the decision of the Interior Court of Appeal in Reza, Regina versus Rezabos. That was a situation where the accused lady was charged with murder. The co-accused had already pleaded guilty to murder. And the uh, The accused was charged with non-capital murder. The theory of the Crown was that her co-accused who pleaded guilty at the commencement of the trial had caused the victim's death by shooting him in the course of a robbery and the accused was guilty as a party pursuant to section 21.2 of the criminal code. The trial judge in his charge to the jury did not charge the jury on her possible liability as a result of a combination of 213A and D of the criminal code and also did not relate the evidence to the law in relation to her liability as a mere party to the offense. He charged the jury that her knowledge of her co-accused intention coupled with her presence on the scene was sufficient to convict her of the offense. On appeal by the accused from her conviction for non-capital murder, the appeal should be allowed and a new trial 
was ordered. And in the decision near the, the end, the judgment written by Mr. Justice Le Courcier, he said this, now it appears to us that to establish against the appellant the essential elements of the offense of murder as defined in section 213 through section 21.2 involve proof beyond a reasonable doubt of the following, that the accused and Gibson formed an intention in common to carry out the robbery of a taxi driver and to assist each other therein, that it was a probable consequence of the prosecution of the robbery that Gibson would intentionally cause bodily harm to the taxi driver to facilitate the robbery or the subsequent flight. Three, that it was known or ought to have been known by the accused that such consequence was probable. That's 213A. He says, in the alternative, that it was known or ought to have been known to the accused that Gibson had upon his person a weapon, the gun, and would use it if needed. Now that, if needed, comes from the judgment of Mr. Justice, Chief Justice Foteau in Regina versus Coet. I really don't understand why that's needed, if needed, why that has to be there. Five, that Timothy Allward's death ensued from such bodily harm or as a consequence of such possession or the use of such weapon. It wasn't necessary for the Crown to establish that the appellant knew or ought to have known that it was a pro probable that Allward's death would ensue as a consequence of the prosecution of the robbery. It refers to Trenier, it refers to Govoderov, which I've also, and to La Joie. <clears throat> if the charge is first degree murder under section 214.5, can a non-trigger man be guilty of first degree murder on a combination of 213, 214.5, and section 21.2 of the criminal code? Or does Section 214.5 confine guilt to the person who caused the death? Without uh, reading it to you, the decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal, as I understand it, in uh, Woods and Grainer, says only the trigger man. During the course of the reasons of Chief Justice Howland, he said, Professor Alan Mewitt, in a learned article on first degree murder, in 21 Criminal Law Quarterly 82, when dealing with section 214.5, suggests at page 92 that where one person only causes the death, since the subsection is silent about what murder is in respect of the person who has not caused the death, section 214 does not apply at all, leaving that person guilty by virtue of section 21 only of second degree murder. He goes on to point out that if both parties to a rape both cause, in the legal sense, the death of the victim, it seems clear that both would be directly liable for first degree murder without the necessity of invoking section 21. Similarly, he submits that for section 214.6 to come into operation, it must be the actual killer who has the prior conviction for first or second degree murder. Section 214.5 is open to the reasonable construction that Parliament did not intend 21.2 to be applicable to it. Accordingly, the operation 214.5 should be limited to the person who actually caused the death. Section 222, attempted murder, in Section 24 is the attempt. Is there such an offense as a constructive attempt to commit murder? Can there be parties, section 21.2, to a constructive attempt to commit murder under section 213? There's a reported decision shows that one judge, Mr. Justice Ray in British Columbia, refused to charge a jury on a charge of attempt to commit murder founded on section 213D. However, it seems to me that the better view is that section 213 of the criminal code can form the basis of a charge of attempt to commit constructive murder and section 21.2 of the code in conjunction, conjunction with section 213 can create parties to an attempt to commit constructive murder. Chief Justice Cartwright said this in Trenere, at the risk of repetition, it is my opinion that on a true construction of 202, which is now 213, and section 21.2 is applied to the circumstances of this case, it was necessary to support a verdict of guilty against the respondent that the Crown should establish that it was, in fact, a probable consequence, and he lists, lists them out. 
Then in the, in the uh, <clears throat> later case of Bourgeois, Mr. Justice Martland said, in relation to the present case, the important point is that in applying Section 21.2 to the offense of murder, this court held in the Trenier case that the commission of the offense meant commission in any of the ways contemplated by the criminal code and not merely its commission in the form of an intentional killing. Similarly, in my opinion, when Section 24.1 refers to an intent to commit an offense in relation to murder, it means an intention to commit that offense in any of the ways provided for in the criminal code, whether under Section 201 or under Section 212 or Section 213. I come next and deal in a quick way with Section 212, subsection C, homicide, culpable homicide as murder, where a person for an unlawful object does anything that he knows or ought to know is likely to cause death and thereby causes death to a human being, notwithstanding that he desires to affect his object without causing death or bodily harm to any human being. This section, of course, brings to mind the situation where an accused stops, wants to stop a railway train so that he can rob the passengers. He doesn't want to hurt anyone, he doesn't want to kill anyone, but he's determined to rob the passengers and he blows up the track. In 1975, the Interior Court of Appeal had occasion to deal with this very difficult section in the case of Regina, Regina versus Tenet and Nakarata. Uh, I have reproduced for you several pages of that. Um, as I understand that and the subsequent decision in the Supreme Court of Canada in Regina versus Vassal, which I find very difficult reading, um, the question is, they get into the question of the objective and the subjective test, they get into the question of what part drunkenness plays, intoxication, and it becomes uh, rather difficult to, to grab. As I understand them, it is this, that you first of all must have an unlawful object. Mr. Justice Lemaire says in the summary at the end of the Vassal case, it must be something that is an indictable offense if prosecuted. And uh, the act to pursue this must be dangerous. It need not be illegal, but it must be dangerous, although because it is dangerous, it usually is illegal, but not necessarily so. And uh, what's the test that you, you go by? He says, he summarized it this way. He says, for these reasons, I feel that the interpretation of Section 212C as it relates to drunkenness adopted by the Court of Appeal for Ontario in this case and in that of Tenet and Nacarado is much more in harmony with the current attitudes of this court in relation to criminal liability than that adapted by this court in Graves. The order of the Court of Appeal directing new trial should stand. I would summarize my conclusions as to the interpretation and application of 212C as follows. In a prosecution under that paragraph, the element of unlawfulness necessary to qualify a homicide as culpable under 2055A is that which is the result of the prosecution of an unlawful object by the act which is dangerous to life. So <clears throat> the man who wants to collect on the insurance and goes and torches the building. The dangerous to life is the torching of the building. The unlawful act is the the fraud or what have you to gain the insurance monies. B, two, there is therefore no requirement that the dangerous act be itself unlawful, though because it is dangerous to life, it usually is. Three, when, as in this case, the dangerous act is unlawful, it was setting fire, the jury must be told, as the trial judge did, that there must be the prosecution of a further unlawful object, clearly distinct from the immediate object of the dangerous unlawful act. The words unlawful object when used in 213C mean the object of conduct which if prosecuted fully would amount to a serious crime that is an indictable offense requiring mens rea. 
While the test under 212C is objective and the behavior of the accused is to be measured by that of the reasonable man, such a test must nevertheless be applied having regard not to the knowledge of a reasonable man would have had of the surrounding circumstances that allegedly made the accused conduct dangerous to life, but to the knowledge that the accused had under those circumstances. As I understand that is this, what did the accused know? And in coming to that conclusion, the jury is entitled to take into consideration, does he have an IQ of 250? Does he, is he a dull normal? How much did he have to drink? And he decide all that as to what he knew. Having decide what he knew, you then go back and ask the question whether or not a reasonable person with the knowledge that the accused had would do such a thing, or how is the section worded? Knew whether the reasonable man knew or ought to have known was likely to cause death. And if the jury says, yes, he knew there were people in that house when he put the torch to it, then drunkenness, intoxication is not relevant with regard to the consequences. That's how I understand it. Please don't quote me in the Court of Appeal. Um, I think that I probably run over or past my time. May I just say that constructive murder, and, and Mr. Justice Zuber said in the DeWolf case, cases such as Tenet and Nacarado and other constructive murder cases, he was talking about 212C, can well be regarded as high watermarks of the construction and application of this subsection and should not be construed as points of departure. As I said, uh, felony murder rule, constructive murder can be harsh in a particular case. The rule does not sit well with civil libertarians and law reformers. However, I predict that we will have constructive murder as part of the Criminal Code of Canada in some form or another for many years to come. Why? Because in a way it's civic self-defense. It is society's way of trying to protect itself by saying that he who uses violent measures in the commission of a felony involving personal violence does so at his own risk. And guilty of murder if those violent measures result even inadvertently in the death of the victim. It's late. You've been very kind. Thank you very much.
as a party pursuant to Section 21.2 of the Criminal Code. The trial judge in his charge to the jury did not charge the jury on her possible liability as a result of a combination of 213A and D of the Criminal Code and also did not relate the evidence to the law in relation to her liability as a mere party to the offense. He charged the jury that her knowledge of her co-accused intention coupled with her presence on the scene was sufficient to convict her of the offense. On appeal by the accused from her conviction for non-capital murder, the appeal should be allowed and a new trial was ordered. And in the decision near the, the end, judgment written by Mr. Justice LeCourcier, he said this, now it appears to us that to establish against the appellant the essential elements of the offense of murder as defined in section 213 through section 21.2 involve proof beyond a reasonable doubt of the following, that the accused and Gibson formed intention in common to carry out the robbery of a taxi driver and to assist each other therein that it was a probable consequence of the prosecution of the robbery that Gibson would intentionally cause bodily harm to the taxi driver to facilitate the robbery or the subsequent flight. Three, that it was known or ought to have been known by the accused that such consequence was probable. That's 213A. He says, in the alternative, that it was known or ought to have been known to the accused that Gibson had upon his person a weapon, the gun, and would use it if needed. That, if needed, comes from the judgment of Mr. Justice, Chief Justice Foteau in Regina versus Coet. I really don't understand why that's needed, if needed, why that has to be there. Five, that Timothy Allward's death ensued from such bodily harm or as a consequence of such possession or the use of such weapon. It wasn't necessary for the Crown to establish that the appellant knew or ought to have known that it was a po probable that Allward's death would ensue as a consequence of the prosecution of the robbery. It refers to Trenier, it refers to Govaderov, which I've also, and then to La Joie. <clears throat> if the charge is first degree murder under section 214.5, can a non-trigger man be guilty of first degree murder on a combination of 213, 214.5 and section 21.2 of the criminal code? Or does section 214.5 confine guilt to the person who caused the death? Without uh, reading it to you, the decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal, as I understand it, in uh, Woods and Grainer says only the trigger man. During the course of the reasons of Chief Justice Howland, he said, Professor Alan Mewitt in a learned article on first degree murder in 21 Criminal Law Quarterly 82, when dealing with section 214.5, suggests at page 92 that where one person only causes the death, since the subsection is silent about what murder is in respect of the person who has not caused the death, section 214 does not apply at all, leaving that person guilty by virtue of section 21 only of second degree murder. He goes on to point out that if both parties to a rape both cause, in the legal sense, the death of the victim, it seems clear that both would be directly liable for first degree murder without the necessity of invoking section 21. Similarly, he submits that for section 214.6 to come into operation, it must be the actual killer who has the prior conviction for first or second degree murder. Section 214.5 is open to the reasonable construction that Parliament did not intend 21.2 to be applicable to it. Accordingly, the operation 214.5 should be limited to the person who actually caused the death. Section 222, attempted murder, and section 24 is the attempt. Is there such an offense as a constructive attempt to commit murder? Can there be parties, section 21.2, to a constructive attempt to commit murder under section 213? There's a reported decision shows that one judge, Mr. Justice Ray in British Columbia, refused to charge a jury on a charge of attempt to commit murder founded on section 213D. However, it seems to me that the better view is that section 213 of the criminal code can form the basis of a charge of attempt to commit constructive murder 
and Section 21.2 of the Code in conjunction, conjunction with Section 213 can create parties to an attempt to commit constructive murder. Chief Justice Cartwright said this in Trenier, at the risk of repetition, it is my opinion that on a true construction of 202, which is now 213, and Section 21.2 is applied to the circumstances of this case, it was necessary to support a verdict of guilty against the respondent that the Crown should establish that it was, in fact, a probable consequence. And he lists, lists them out. Then in the, in the uh, <clears throat> later case of Rojois, Mr. Justice Martland said, in relation to the present case, the important point is that in applying Section 21.2 to the offense of murder, this court held in the Trenier case that the commission of the offense meant commission in any of the ways contemplated by the criminal code and not merely its commission in the form of an intentional killing. Similarly, in my opinion, when Section 24.1 refers to an intent to commit an offense in relation to murder, it means an intention to commit that offense in any of the ways provided for in the criminal code, whether under Section 201 or under Section 212 or Section 213. I come next and deal in a quick way with Section 212, subsection C, homicide, culpable homicide as murder, where a person for an unlawful object does anything that he knows or ought to know is likely to cause death and thereby causes death to a human being, notwithstanding that he desires to affect his object without causing death or bodily harm to any human being. This section, of course, brings to mind the situation where an accused stops, wants to stop a railway train so that he can rob the passengers. He doesn't want to hurt anyone, he doesn't want to kill anyone, but he's determined to rob the passengers and he blows up the track. In 1975, the Interior Court of Appeal had occasion to deal with this very difficult section in the case of Regina, Regina versus Tenet and Nakarata. Uh, I have reproduced for you several pages of that. Um, as I understand that and the subsequent decision in the Supreme Court of Canada in Regina versus Vassal, which I find very difficult reading, um, the question is, do they get into the question of the objective and the subjective test? They get into the question of what part drunkenness plays, intoxication, and it becomes uh, rather difficult to, to grab. As I understand them, it is this, that you first of all must have an unlawful object. Mr. Justice Lemaire says in the summary at the end of the Vassal case, it must be something that is an indictable offense if prosecuted. And uh, the act to pursue this must be dangerous. It need not be illegal, but it must be dangerous, although because it is dangerous, it usually is illegal, but not necessarily so. And uh, what's the test that you, you go by? He says, he summarized it this way. He says, for these reasons, I feel that the interpretation of section 212C as it relates to drunkenness adopted by the Court of Appeal for Ontario in this case and in that of Tenet and Nacarado is much more in harmony with the current attitudes of this court in relation to criminal liability than that adapted by this court in Graves. The order of the Court of Appeal directing new trial should stand. I would summarize my conclusions as to the interpretation and application of 212C as follows. In a prosecution under that paragraph, the element of unlawfulness necessary to qualify a homicide as culpable under 2055A is that which is the result of the prosecution of an unlawful object by the act which is dangerous to life. So <clears throat> the man who wants to collect on the insurance and goes and torches the building. The dangerous to life is the torching of the building. The unlawful act is the the fraud or what have you to gain the insurance monies. B, two, there is therefore no requirement that the dangerous act be itself unlawful, though because it is dangerous to life, it usually is. Three, 
when, as in this case, the dangerous act is unlawful, it was setting fire, the jury must be told, as the trial judge did, that there must be the prosecution of a further unlawful object, clearly distinct from the immediate object of the dangerous unlawful act. The words unlawful object when used in 213C mean the object of conduct which if prosecuted fully would amount to a serious crime, that is, an indictable offense requiring mens rea. While the test under 212C is objective and the behavior of the accused is to be measured by that of the reasonable man, such a test must nevertheless be applied having regard not to the knowledge of a reasonable man would have had of the surrounding circumstances that allegedly made the accused conduct dangerous to life, but to the knowledge that the accused had under those circumstances. As I understand that is this, what did the accused know? And in coming to that conclusion, the jury is entitled to take into consideration, does he have an IQ of 250? Does he, is he a dull normal? How much do he have to drink? And you decide all that as to what he knew. Having decided what he knew, you then go back and ask the question whether or not a reasonable person with the knowledge that the accused had would do such a thing, or how is the section worded? Knew whether the reasonable man knew or ought to have known would likely to cause death. And if the jury says, yes, he knew there were people in that house when he put the torch to it, then drunkenness, intoxication is not relevant with regard to the consequences. That's how I understand it. Please don't quote me in the Court of Appeal. Um, I think that I probably run over or past my time. May I just say that constructive murder, and, and Mr. Justice Zuber said in the DeWolf case, cases such as Tenet and Nacarado and other constructive murder cases, he was talking about 212C, can well be regarded as high watermarks of the construction and application of this subsection and should not be construed as points of departure. As I said, the uh, felony murder rule, constructive murder, can be harsh in a particular case. The rule does not sit well with civil libertarians and law reformers. However, I predict that we will have constructive murder as part of the Criminal Code of Canada in some form or another for many years to come. Why? Because in a way it's civic self-defense. It is society's way of trying to protect itself by saying that he who uses violent measures in the commission of a felony involving personal violence does so at his own risk. And guilty of murder if those violent measures result even inadvertently in the death of the victim. It's late. You've been very kind. Thank you very much. As everybody runs off, our thanks to our three speakers tonight to Judge Vanini for again confirming the quality of justice in the North, to His Honor Judge Charles, who at least from the defense side we thank for Deadman and hopefully it will be restored by the Supreme Court of Canada, and to Mr. Justice O'Driscoll who in his own way has told us all why I'm likely to lose those three appeals he talks of. Thank you.